Welcome to Carbohydrates Part 6. Um, in this tutorial, we'll look at some of the other um, metabolic processes of glucose. Um, this will get developed further when you get to your biology classes, but it's worth at least a brief introduction. Let's get started. Alrighty. So, we recognize, right, glucose um, is, the, is the star of the show here, right? So, uppercase G. And we've looked at that um, if we have too much glucose, then we can store it as glycogen, right, a polysaccharide. So we have our monosaccharide glucose and our polysaccharide glycogen, and, right, and that's all about energy storage. So um, if we have plenty of glucose and we're ready to store, then we describe that as glycogenesis, right? So we're going to make glycogen and, right, genesis, right, the creation of glycogen. So that would be here. And think about that in terms of, and that's our energy storage mode. So when all is going well and we're rich and have lots to eat, we're in glycogenesis mode. However, when we need that glycogen for exercising or that sort of thing, um, or we don't have as much food, and so we need some energy sources, right? So we're going to take that glycogen and lysis. We're going to split it apart. We're going to, um, right? So, oops, I don't know why I did that in red, right? So then we have when energy is needed. Okay, so the, um, right? So remember to think about um, glycogen is basically animal starch. That might be helpful to write in. Right, so it's a polysaccharide, right, and you can think of it as animal starch, how we store sugar. Alrighty. Um, we won't look closely at this next branch, um, but glucose can be converted into ribose, which we need for RNA, and so um, because we're going from a six carbon sugar to a five carbon sugar, we call this the pentose pathway. And that's all we're going to really say about that right now. Not too much to say there. But now we will look at um, these important pathways, right? So glucose to pyruvate, we studied that in great detail, right? That is glycolysis. And so that's right here. And then um, one last term is what happens, um, what happens if we're running short on glucose, but we need, um, pyruvate or, um, we need energy. So then we have the term gluconeogenesis, right? So here is where we get the breakdown of proteins in the liver to form glucose from amino acids, right? So this is a like a new source, right? So outside of the carbohydrates, right? So getting glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. And so that would be gluconeogenesis right here. Okay, so we've got these all broke down. There's that one. Okay, so you want to um, be familiar with um, these terms and be able to, right, if I was to um, obscure, obscure these labels, you should be able to fill in the blanks, complete the diagram using, using the, the terms that we have just been introduced to. And then let's look at this very briefly in terms of the regulation of glucose with um, energy metabolism. All right, so um, there are two main hormones that are secreted by the pancreas that play, play a major role in glucose metabolism. So one is for after we've eaten, right? So right after we eat, we are going, we're going to have a rise in blood glucose because we're going to start breaking down the foods in our body to get the glucose. And so at that time, the pancreatic beta cells will release insulin. Right? And so the release of insulin 
um, allows glucose to enter cells faster. It breaks down the glucose um, by glycolysis. It helps with glycogen synthesis um, increasing and it helps with the synthesis of, um, of lipids and proteins, right? So it's all about breaking down that food and, um, and, and so we can use it for energy and to make other important biological molecules. Now, when we have a falling, a falling um, blood glucose level, this means that we've either been fasting, right, or we're starving, right? So sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's not. So then the pancreas is going to release the alpha cell from the, from the pancreatic alpha cells, they will release glucagon, right? So glucagon is all about um, glucose entry to the cells has slowed down. So that means we have to start breaking down glycogen and um, we're going to start looking at other sources of energy, breaking down those proteins um, to get glucose. And that's where nucleo, um, gluconeogenesis starts, right? So we, if we connect this now to up above, right? So this would be the glycogenolysis, right? And this would be the gluconeogenesis happening here. And then conversely, with, um, with insulin, right, glycogen synthesis, so that would be glycogenesis. And then, of course, there's glycolysis. So another important um, application of the, the terms we've defined is looking at um, their role in whether they're there after we eat or when we're fasting or starving. So those are the connections that you want to make between the four, um, the four pathways and um, where they would show up um, in a schematic and where they would show up um, in our day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day rhythms of life, whether we've just eaten or it's been a while. So um, then I want to look a little more closely in this last page um, at exactly what happens when we've been fasting or starving, right? So some of this is a paraphrase from the previous page. Um, now instead of words, we're seeing it in a diagram, all right? So here we could see that this is the hours of starvation. So zero would be we've just finished eating. Okay, so when we've just finished eating, what we, what we saw on the previous page was, right, insulin's released. Insulin um, triggers that we are going to, um, right, that we will be um, producing glycogen and metab you know, glycolysis, that sort of thing, um, right there. Alrighty. So right after we've eaten, we're going to have glycogenesis and glycolysis occurring. And so that, that um, leads to, uh, what do I want to say there? All right, I think that's enough. Now, let's look at what happens, um, right? So once we finish in eating, insulin released. Okay, and so, and that's going to trigger glycolysis and glycogenesis. Now, we, the part that I want to look at a little more closely then is we get this gradual decline in blood sugar. So as the blood sugar declines, right, that's going to trigger the release of the glucagon, all right? And so, Right, so the lowering of blood sugar triggers the release of glucagon, and so then what that does is then that triggers the, um, the, the glycogenolysis and the gluconeogenesis. And so we see that we start to get a buildup of, um, of free fatty acids, and we see our liver glycogen starts to drop, and then this is the key part that I wanted to talk about. We'll see a rise in the ketone bodies, right? So everything in red 
is right triggered by fasting. Alrighty, okay. Something that's very interesting. Um, okay, so let's keep talking about the ketone bodies for a minute. So the ketone bodies form from an excess of acetyl-CoA. And it's interesting because brain and other tissues catabolize the ketone bodies to produce ATP. So it's basically like the ketone bodies are an emergency energy source because we're not getting food, whether we're choosing to fast or because none's available. So I find this next part fascinating. Um, so people with diabetes mellitus um, biochemically, there's something going on that prevents the glucose from being utilized or stored um, and related to the insulin. And there's a couple reasons that could cause that, and you'll learn more about that in your bio. Um, but the point is, is basically that a person with diabetes, in the essence, is starving to death. Because the body cannot utilize the glucose, it, um, it has to go into the gluconeogenesis and starts breaking down fats and the consequence whether we're fasting or we have diabetes we get a buildup of acetyl-CoA and that acetyl-CoA leads to the formation of the ketone bodies so now we want to look a little more closely at these ketone bodies alrighty so here we have two molecules you should recognize Right? This is the acetyl-CoA, and we have a buildup. Right? So through that buildup of acetyl-CoA, then the acetyl-CoA molecules start reacting with each other, producing coenzyme A, and then here are the ketone bodies. Okay, so in the short term, it's an emergency energy source, but long term, right, if the concentration of t ketone bodies becomes too high, so this can happen from diabetes or a very low carbohydrate diet, it actually creates ketoacidosis. Because if we look here, right, we can see that we have a lot of um, acidic groups, and then we can see that we have the ketones. So we can see why they get called ketone bodies. And then we recognize the, um, the acidity there with those carboxylic acid groups. All right, so the ketone bodies cannot be completely metabolized. So um, acetone, right, so here's acetone. Let's see, where is that? Right, so there's acetone right there, right? So there's acetone. So if we've exercised really aggressively or if um, we're with somebody that has diabetes, um, we can actually smell the acetone on the breath. And so a lot of times if someone's an incoming into a hospital or to a medical clinic, um, just the simple smelling of acetone on the breath lets a, lets a, um, a medical care provider know about um, a lot of information. All right? And then um, we can see that the pH of the blood decreases. And so this affects the ability of the hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Breathing can become difficult. And um, ketoacidosis can actually lead to coma or death. So um, it's another important aspect of, of glucose metabolism to look at, or actually the lack of glucose metabolism leads to the formation of these ketone bodies which in the short term provide energy, but do have long-term health effects if our body stays in that state. So please take some time now to work a few homework problems to reinforce your understanding.